Steve Brown and welcome to our presentation, hopefully interactive, about changes we have made in the performance-based masters and teaching shells so that we can increase engagement and accomplish other things which are important for our program. And before I go any further, it would actually be really helpful because we can direct our presentation accordingly if you all would answer the questions on the survey which we have for you, which is about what mode you primarily teach in. So it should be available up there for you. And there is the a choice of performance-based. Online is number two. Number three is mixed mode or in person. And number four, I am a course manager. And if you don't know what you are, you can be a course manager as well. <laughs> so we'll just take it, take it that way. And I'm going to get the results reported to me because we are sharing our screen. While I do so, let me introduce the other two members of our presentation crew. And actually, you'll be hearing a lot more from them than you are, Will, from me. We have Susan Gray, who is also with our Performance Bait Masters in Teaching program and has been very active with Brian Munn. Our third member, he is from eLearning, and he's been a specialist in putting together this new shell that we have. So now I'm interested in what our poll results are. We have one performance-based, four online, five mixed mode, and one course manager. Okay. Well, we'll use that then. I'll give you a little background then on performance-based, or what we mean by performance-based, and then we'll go into what we have in the shell. So we view the main difference in performance-based is that students are responsible for directing their learning. So we say it's a student-centered course rather than instructor-centered. So students determine their course schedule. Students determine what resources they're going to use from what the instructor makes available. And students even determine when during the time of the course that they're going to turn in their evidence that demonstrates their understanding. Each course has two instructors, a facilitator and assessor. A facilitator fills the role that we often think of as an instructor having, putting together welcome materials, organizing resources, giving feedback to students as they proceed. But the assessor is someone who takes the outcomes from the course and the evidence that the students submit and determines whether they have met standard or not. And again, students get to determine how they're going to demonstrate they've mastered the competencies in a course. So why do we do it? Why did we even start doing it here? In addition to the fact, and there's a link here, of having performance-based be our version of competency-based education, where students are able to present and use what they've learned in the past to meet the standards that are presented to them. Well, for us in our program, it removes barriers for students who don't live here and aren't able to attend our live sessions. But it also provides flexibility for students to work at a more individualized pace since they set the calendars, as well as rooms for more creative students who don't like to just go within the lines of the box, but like to bring in resources, past life experience, and other things to present to the assessor what they've learned and how they can apply it. And it gives students the flexibility to play with, to their own strengths, challenges them to think creatively, and allows them to draw on their existing knowledge and their new knowledge. By the way, I should also mention that PBMIT is performance-based masters in teaching. So we're working with people who want to become teachers. And the competency-based education wave is also sweeping into a lot of K-12 education. And it's sort of sister, if you will, or other relatives include 
project-based learning, uh, differentiated learning, etc. So, just so you know why we uh, worked on our Blackboard shells to update them, we found that there were certain areas that were a little cumbersome using the traditional Blackboard exemplary setup. And so we had the opportunity to try an experimental new platform, which we did for three plus quarters. It was on a grant. CityU decided not to renew that grant in large part because it was difficult running two platforms at the same time. But then we said, we learned a lot by doing this. How can we bring those things that we learn into our Blackboard shells? And so we made changes to address the course structure, to bring in more tools to use with formative assessments, and allowed us to communicate more with our students. And to get into the details, Susan and Brian are going to come on and take you through that. Thank you, Steve. Um, so one of the first things I'd like to point out is um, that these PB Blackboard shells look a little different than um, non-PB shells. Right, on the right, you see an example of the navigation pane that is part of every course other than our PB courses. Um, but let me show you. I actually have a um, demo course pulled up here. Um, all the Really what we wanted to do is we use slightly different tools in the PB modality, and so we wanted to make those tools really easily available to the student. And so, for example, at the beginning of every PB course, there's a link for you know, new start here. Um, students kind of come in during different times and are, you know, it's an individualized pace. And so students are always at different points, so we make it very easy for them to get started. Um, we have a lot of tools here. Um, you can see that the course is divided into competencies. Um, and there's a place here for a check-in journal and a dedicated place to submit evidence of their learning. Um, I'll let Susan. Um, so on the left, when you see the competencies, what those actually are, those translate from the syllabus as the actual assignments that are in the course. Um, and the rubrics that you get when you get a course to facilitate or to instruct, those rubrics are what those students are being graded on. So the difference between performance-based and regular online or mixed mode is that in a competency, that we are giving them some resources and some tools, but really they are the ones who are guiding their own completion of that assignment and showing competency in that. So um, it's, it's much more self-paced that way. Cool. Thank you, Susan. Let's hop back into here. So what we wanted the bulk of this presentation to be about is um, we wanted to share with you some of these tools and um, techniques that we've implemented. Um, the reason we decided to implement them for our performance-based classes is because these really make, you know, because of the individualized nature of our PB classes, we really needed these tools. But in, in implementing these, we've kind of realized that everything that we do in PB can be adapted for non-PB modality. And so there are a couple tools that we would really like to highlight just to give you some ideas of other ways to engage with your students in, in your courses. Uh, so the first one is a course calendar. I'm going to let Susan talk about that. Um, so the course calendar is basically the student's own creation of their own course schedule. So um, in a normal online or mixed mode class, the instructor is usually the one who is giving deadlines and telling students what to look at each week, maybe posting a discussion board each week. So in a performance-based course, students actually guide their own deadlines and guide their own learning. So these are two examples on the screen now of two different um, course calendars that students have turned in. Um, and they basically just come up with their own deadlines. And then if they need to adjust those at any point, that's totally OK and fine. But then they need to submit a new course calendar to hold themselves accountable and also to help us hold them accountable, too. Yeah, and then the way that we made that happen in Blackboard is that, um, you know, the real secret behind this is actually just an assignment. Um, and so it's linked here permanently in the navigation panel. It's also one of the first things that students see in the Start Here section. 
Um, but it works just like any other assignment that you would have in Blackboard. Um, for the PBMIT program, um, this is worth zero points, but it is set up so that every time a student submits it or resubmits it, it shows up for the instructor as needs grading. So it's a great way to stay on top of it. Um, the instructor can provide feedback on the schedule. Um, and so it's a great way to make sure that both parties are communicating about what their plans and expectations are. And the fact that it's been reviewed shows up in the grade book. Correct. Um, yeah, so for these, um, we've set it up for these courses to be worth zero points. But in the grade book, it shows us complete or incomplete. It'll have a check mark there if the student has done it. And so that's a great way just to really quickly see which of your students have completed this. And one other thing about the course calendars that's really cool is that when students submit it and it needs grading, even though it's worth zero points, the instructor can go in and look at their deadlines and say, well, this is really ambitious, what you've decided to do and to leave yourself one week to get this competency done. Just so you know, historically, uh, people tend to take longer on this one than others. So you can give kind of upfront feedback like that and almost always students really appreciate kind of knowing in advance which ones are going to take a little bit longer than others. Yeah, great point. Let me... Okay, the next tool that I want to show you is um, formative assessments. We've... Actually, that student... Sure. Let Susan start talking about this one. Um, so formative assessments are something that are in all exemplary courses um, or should be in all exemplary courses in some form. Um, in performance based, we've done that in the form of draft submissions for all of the competencies. So any assignment a student has, any draft, they have to turn in a draft first. Um, and that's part of the requirement of the course in performance based. So they turn in a draft and they actually get pretty extensive feedback from the facilitator on that draft um, before they even have the option of submitting a final. Um, so that way they can make revisions, then it's a good way for the, the facilitator to kind of know where that student is at coming in, um, as well as offer a lot of really valuable feedback for their learning and also for the rubric. I mean, you can leave feedback like actually in the rubric for, hey, I don't really see this part being hit very well. So. Yeah, and one of the um, one of some of the mechanics behind this in Blackboard is we decided to use adaptive release, um, basically meaning that a student doesn't the option to submit a final is hidden from the student until they have received feedback on a draft. So in you know in our performance based courses, drafts are worth zero points as part of their overall grade, but it is still a requirement, and it you know them receiving that feedback opens up the ability to submit. Yeah. Um, so the other cool thing about giving feedback on drafts is that the assessor then can go back in and look and see what feedback that student was already given. So they can look at those specific things and say, I know you were told to do this or that. <laughs> Did you actually address it um, adequately? So that's really helpful as well. Yeah. And then um, this kind of spills over into the other slide. So I'll show you in just a moment what that looks like in practice. Um, but one of the other things is that, you know, technically you have two copies of the assignment. There's a draft and a final. That also makes it really easy to assign to a facilitator. You know, all drafts go to the facilitator and all of the finals go to the assessor in the case of, of these courses. Um, but yeah, to continue on what um, Susan was saying, you know, part of um, exemplary course standards is that you need to provide feedback in the learning system. So in this case, you know, it's hard to keep track of feedback that was given to a student if it was just done through email, right? Um, and so there's, there's multiple tools that we can use to um, provide feedback that stays in Blackboard. And, you know, one of the reasons, a few of the reasons why we want to emphasize that is so that, um, like, like Susan was saying, the assessor has access to the feedback that the facilitator left them. Um, also, if things go awry and there's a need for a great appeal, um, someone like a um, program director can go in and view that as well. Also, if financial aid comes knocking and needs to know if the student has been participating in that course or if they're making progress, 
um, it makes it easy for us to do that and we don't have to go dig through a million emails. Um, so yeah, let me show you real quick some of the ways that you can um, view feedback, or excuse me, that you can provide feedback. Um, so I'm actually going to go into the Grade Center. This is a fake student named Gwen. Um, but we see here that she has done a submission of Competency 1, the final. And so we'll go ahead and I clicked on the wrong thing. I'm sorry. And we'll view her attempts. So um, I know a lot of people that I talk to are already familiar with how to use Microsoft Word to track changes and then re-upload that. So I'm going to gloss over that for today. But um, we have this inline grading feature called Box. And so for most file types, um, specifically like Word, PDF, um, are the most common ones, you can actually provide feedback directly on the assignment. So if I was the instructor, I wanted to, you know, add a comment here. Could you elaborate a little more on this, right? Um, so the student can see that as well, and it is kind of attached to the document. Um, the other way is grading directly on the rubric. Now, um, part of exemplary course facilitation is that you should be grading on the rubric anyway, but you also can provide feedback directly in the rubric. So I'm going to open up this um, primary rubric, learning theories. A couple things I'll show you real quick. Um, you can actually check this box and see all the descriptions of each level for each criteria. So if you need that as a reference, that's great. Um, but also you can show feedback. So I can leave feedback specifically about this one criteria if I want to, you know, kind of drill down into that. Or down at the bottom, there's also overall feedback. Um, so this is actually my favorite way of grading um, assignments in Blackboard in all modalities, not just performance-based. Um, but what I'll usually do as a facilitator or an instructor is open up both of those things. So I'll put show descriptions and show feedback. And then I can click where I think the, the candidate falls as well as putting feedback. I try to put feedback in all but one, if possible, area of the rubric, sometimes all. Um, and then I always, almost always try to put an overall statement at the bottom, kind of summarizing all of those things too. So they, they, they get quite a bit of feedback if you do it this way. Great. Yeah, and then just again to gently reemphasize that, you know, one of the reasons why we push for um, providing feedback in Blackboard is so that it's available um, as, a, as a record. Right? It's hard to track feedback that was just provided over the phone or through an email chain. So, let's And the up. second reason is as a record of substantive engagement, particularly for purposes of financial aid, because as will be discussed coming up, um, in performance space we don't have, in contrast to other online uh, courses, a requirement of discussion board participation every week. But we do expect all of our students in the course to be engaged. So this is one of the ways that we can demonstrate in the shell that they are engaged. All right. Well, we've got one final tool that we'd like to show you. Um, it's the check-in journal. So I'll let Susan talk to you about that. Yeah, so this kind of goes off of what Steve was saying about leaving a record of interactions that you've had with the student in the shell. Um, so this check-in journal is something that is not currently in most regular online shells, but it's something that we've piloted in performance based and it's actually been really, really great. Um, so this is a way for students to privately check in. It's basically just like sending an email, except it's in Blackboard, so there's a way for any program director, any great appeals committee, any financial aid advisor can go in and actually see what has happened between you and the student. And that actually not only protects you if you're doing <laughs> doing what you need to do and be giving feedback to, in a timely manner and all of that, that pr it proves that as well as for the student, it's a place for them to go where it's private. Um, if they want to interact with other students in the course, there's the public discussion board as well, which is always an option for them, and some students actually do use it, um, and others choose to do the private um, way instead. 
often also with the check-in journal, if I'm getting the same question from more than one student, usually I'll just post an announcement um, in the shell that sort of answers that question for everybody. So it's another way for you to interact with everyone around without having to answer the same question over and over. Yeah. Let me show you what that looks like in Blackboard. Um, so I'm going to cancel out of this. It's a long rubric. Okay. Um, and like I mentioned before, in our PB courses we designed it where it has a very specific spot in the navigation pane in every course. So you come to my check-in journal. My favorite thing about the journals is that it works very much in, from the student's perspective, it basically feels like the way you'd post on a discussion board, right? So the, um, we've got the prompts here, um, which these are specific to this course, but um, I can see here that Gwen has posted something about, hey, I'm working on competency one, I had a question, can you give me more resources, right? Here's a status update on my first draft. And so as the instructor, you can come in. I guess one thing I should point out to you real quickly is that you can select, I mean, the instructor has a journal too, but here's where you would see every student's journal and the number of posts that they've made. So I would select Gwen as the student, and then, oh, I see here she has a journal entry. Cool. I can comment here. Um, great question. I can't type today, but right, I can just write out my response there. One of the other really great things that you can do with this tool is um, you can kind of track conversations that happen outside of Blackboard. I would never want to slap other modes of communications out of someone's hand. You know, if it's more convenient for the student to do a phone call or you've already had a conversation over email, um, but by all means don't tell the student they're not allowed to talk to you outside of Blackboard. But a really great thing to do is to kind of follow up and leave a record of that. So as the instructor, you could say, like, hi, Gwen, it was great to speak with you on the phone yesterday. Um, or, you know, Susan was met at her. Um, so along with that also, it's really good to put the accountability on the student to do that as well. So if you've had a phone conversation with them, um, you can also have the expectation that they come in and post in the journal hi instructor, it was great talking to you, and then they summarize what the conversation was so that you know what they heard and that <laughs> everybody's on the same page. Yeah, and then um, one of the other benefits of this from a more like technological standpoint is that it, you know, we've set them up to act, to kind of behave like assignments. So they're set to show um, needs grading in the Grade Center every time the student posts. And so it's a really easy way to kind of keep track of when you have um, things to go comment on. I think we might so have are the check-in journals assessed or are they worth any points? And if so, is there a rubric for that? That's what you can do. Um, so it depends on the course and what the syllabus actually says. Um, for PBMIT courses, no, they're not assessed. They're really just for informational purposes for the student. Um, we have other uh, courses in other programs, like the MED program, that does have a requirement for a weekly check-in from students, and that's how they can grade that and track whether the, the student has actually checked in or not. Um, and then Cindy asked, um, is journals in the course tools the same as the check-in journals? Yes, we, um, we just renamed it. We, sorry, we, we manually renamed the label because that's how we refer to it for the students, and so we changed the name in the navigation pane. But we're actually out of time. We've got one minute. Um, Cindy, I'm going to drop my email into the chat if you want to reach out to me. Do you want to show that slide, too, because it has who to contact? Oh, I forgot. I have one more slide for you. Sorry. Here's us. <laughs> um, if you want a walkthrough on how to do this, you can talk to the instructional designers, um, who are me and Whitney Boswell. Um, or you can also reach out to Steve or Susan um, for ideas on how to implement that kind of at a program level. Um, yeah. That's great. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, we'll be back with the panelists at the end, and we will be happy to follow up with you um, if you would like.